Everyone knows the best team in baseball doesn't always win the World Series. In fact, you're less likely to win if you have baseball's best record. In my first episode in this series, I found that between 2013 and 2022, four teams won the World Series, two lost the World Series, and four lost the Division Series. Today, let's reboot and look at baseball's best team between 2003 and 2012. In 2003, there was a tie at the top, the Braves and Yankees both winning 101 games. I'm using run differential as a tiebreaker, and the Braves were plus 167 and the Yankees plus 161, so let's focus on the Braves. This was the 12th straight year they won their division, but they had a lot of playoff frustration. They won 101 games in 2002 also, but lost to the Giants in 5. Despite having the same record, they had a completely different approach. In 2002, they were 10th in offense and 1st in pitching. In 2003, they were 1st in offense and 9th in pitching. Having lost Tom Glavin over the offseason, and Greg Maddox having a down year, Javi Lopez had a crazy year and finished 5th for MVP, and Marcus Giles, Gary Sheffield, and the Jones boys all had amazing years. They were faced with the Cubs for the NLDS, and once again, they were faced with a Game 5 at home. Kerry Wood pitched 8 phenomenal innings, and the Cubs cruised to a 5-1 victory. In 2004, the St. Louis Cardinals finished 105-57. This was coming off a down year in 2003, the first time they had missed the playoffs in four years. And although that 2003 team finished second in offense, their pitching was 11th. In 2004, their offense was about the same and jumped to number one, and their team ERA dropped almost a full run and finished second, backed up by the arrival of Jason Marquis and Chris Carpenter. That offense also had three guys with an OPS over 1,000, Albert Pujols, Jim Edmonds, and Scott Rowland. They put the runs on the board, the starters kept them in it, and Jason Isringhausen came on to close 47 games that year. They cruised past the Dodgers in the NLDS, fell behind the Astros after losing all three games in Houston, but used a Jim Edmonds walk-off in Game 6, and a great performance from Jeff Supon in the bullpen to take Game 7. Then they met a team of destiny, the Red Sox, who had just came back from down 3-0 to the Yankees. And after the Red Sox won a wild Game 1, 11-9, the Cardinals only scored three runs combined over the next three games, and they were swept out of the World Series. In 2005, the Cardinals were back again, 162. This team wasn't quite as dominant, but Albert Pujols put up his typical insane numbers and won his first MVP, leading the National League's third best offense. The team ERA dropped a quarter run, good for first place in the league. Mark Mulder joining the team and having a great year, and Chris Carpenter's 2.83 ERA was good enough to win him a Cy Young. That year, he completed seven games, including four shutouts. They dispatched the 82 win Padres in three games, then had a rematch with the Astros. They won game one behind Carpenter, but Roy Oswald, Roger Clemens, and Brandon Backey stifled the offense over the next three games. It looked like Andy Pettit out Carpenter in Game 5, but down to their last out, Pujols launched that famous homer off Lidge, sending the series back to St. Louis, but Roy Oswald was unfazed and the Astros won their first pennant. In 2006, there was a tie between the two teams that called New York home. The Mets and Yankees both finished 97-65, and but the Yankees had a much better run differential, beating the Mets by 60 runs, so let's focus on them. The Yankees were still winning a ton of games, this being their sixth straight year winning at least 95 games, but they hadn't won the World Series in any of those years. The 05 team won 95, and their offense was number two, but their pitching was number nine, losing to the Angels in the ALDS. They added Bobby Abreu and Johnny Damon, helping them score 930 runs, which was first place, and their pitching slightly improved, now ranked number six. That offense was so good, Randy Johnson won 17 games and had a 5 ERA. They played the upstart Wildcard Tigers in the ALDS, and after winning Game 1, the Tigers stole Game 2, and then just bludgeoned the Yankees at home, winning the next two by a combined 11 runs. In 2007, we had a tie for first place. The Red Sox and Indians both went 96-66, and but Boston's run differential almost doubled that of Cleveland, 210 versus 107. The Red Sox had a down year in 2006, missing the playoffs with 86 wins, 6th in offense and 11th in pitching. But in 2007, their offense improved to number 3, and their pitching shot all the way up to number 1, improving their ERA by almost a full run. This was the first year of Daisuke Matsuzaka, and Josh Beckett pitched way better, taking his 5 ERA down to 327 and winning 20 games. On offense, they brought in J.D. Drew and brought up a 23-year-old second baseman, the Rookie of the Year, Dustin Pedroia. They swept the Angels, fell down 3-1 to to the other 96-win team, the Indians, but outscored them over the last three games by 25 runs. Then, they played the Scrappy Rockies, having swept their way to the World Series, and the Red Sox destroyed them, a four-game sweep, and we finally have the best team finishing on top. In 2008, the only team to win 100 games was the Angels. This team had been good for a while at this point, 
Going to the playoffs in 2002, 04, 05, and 07, they had the 4th best offense and 5th best pitching in 2007. And in 2008, their offense dropped all the way down to 10th, but their pitching improved to 3rd. Their run differential was only 68, and their Pythagorean win-loss was only 88 and 74. So it's remarkable that team won 100 games. That 2008 team lost Orlando Cabrera, but they brought on Torrey Hunter, and mid-season, they picked up Mark Teixeira. John Garland was their new arm in the starting rotation, and K-Rod, Francisco Rodriguez, had the bullpen covered, saving a record 62 games. They played host to the Red Sox once again, and after losing the first two games, they went to Fenway and won Game 3 in extras. But in Game 4, Jed Lowry walked off Scott Shields, and the Angels were gone. In 2009, the Yankees won 103 games, and it's not hard to see why. They missed the playoffs in 2008, the first time that had happened since 1993, and that team was just so mediocre. Seventh in runs, eighth in pitching, they still won 89 games, which isn't bad, but this was unacceptable to the Yankees. They went out and spent money. CC Sabathia was the biggest free agent pitcher that year, and they got him, along with AJ Burnett, and on offense, they went out and snagged Mark Deshera. This allowed them to get rid of Jason Giambi, as well as Bobby Abreu, picking up Nick Swisher along the way. Their offense shot up to number one, and their pitching was actually almost identical, but they went from number eight to number three. They were unmatched in the playoffs, and this was A-Rod's redemption tour. In those 15 games, he hit 365, 1308 OPS, 6 home runs, and 18 RBI. They swept the Twins, then took out the Angels in 6, and then finished off the Phillies in 6. In both series, they had 3-1 leads and lost Game 5 and took it back home to win it. This was probably the most dominant team on this list. In 2010, the Phillies were back coming off back-to-back -back NL pennants, and they were better than ever at 97 and 65. In 2009, their offense was already a league best, and their pitching was number six. They went out and added the best pitcher in baseball, Roy Halladay, and he would throw a perfect game, a playoff no-hitter, and win the Cy Young. This helped offset the loss of Cliff Lee. Brad Lidge was also back. After posting a 721 ERA in 2009, he was back under three in 2010. Mid-season, they also picked up Roy Oswalt, and he had a 174 ERA and 12 starts. This team was second in offense and fifth in pitching, and they dominated the Reds in the NLDS, moving on to the Giants in the NLCS. They lost the first game at home, won game two, then the Giants got them in games three and four, but they won game five behind Roy Holiday to send it back to Philly. In the eighth, with the game tied at two apiece, Juan Uribe hit a go-ahead home run off Ryan Madsen, and that was it. Tim Lincecum and Brian Wilson closed out the game and shut the door on baseball's best team. In 2011, the Phillies were even more stacked and finished 102-60. Even before the season, everyone expected them to be great and win the World Series. Either them or Boston, who also stocked up in the offseason. But we all know how that ended. The Phillies lived up to expectations, and that was despite their offense being down. They went from 2nd to 7th, being helped out midseason after getting Hunter Pence from the Astros. But their pitching jumped up to number 1 losing Brad Lidge but giving the ball to Ryan Madsen, who had a very good season and saved 32 games. Their team ERA was just over three, number one in the league, getting amazing years from all their starters. Halliday, Hamels, Oswald, Vance Worley, and Cliff Lee, who they re-signed over the offseason. They went storming into the playoffs, but ran into a very hot Cardinals team. They blew the Cardinals out in game one, but lost two of the next three, each game decided by one or two runs. Then in game five, Chris Carpenter outdueled Roy Halladay, the Cardinals scoring a run after the first two batters of the game, and that was all Carpenter needed. His complete game shutout stunned the Phillies, and even though this team was the most stacked they've ever been, their window would slam shut after this game. In 2012, the Washington Nationals were 98 and 64. They were improving little by little, losing over 100 games in 2008 and 2009, then just 93 in 2010 almost had a 500 record in 2011, and in Davey Johnson's first full year, they put it all together. They were 12th in offense and 6th in pitching in 2011, and in 2012, they improved to 5th in offense and 1st in pitching. This was thanks to Steven Strasburg putting in a full season and signing Gio Gonzalez over the offseason. They also brought up 19-year-old Bryce Harper, who would go on to win Rookie of the Year. This was the start of a great decade for the Nationals, but this was not their year. Before the playoffs, the team decided to shut down Steven Strasburg, he was only 24 years old, coming off Tommy John surgery in 2010, so he was not available in the playoffs. They would play the wildcard Cardinals, and because this was the first year of the one-game wildcard playoff, the Cardinals got the start at home. The teams would split those first two games and play the last three in Washington. Chris Carpenter dominated Game 3, Jason Worth walked off Game 4, and that set up a winner-take-all Game 5. 
the Nats jumped out to a 6-0 lead, but the Cardinals clawed all the way back, and down to their last strike. They stayed alive and scored 4 in the ninth, stunning the Nationals and taking the series. So there you go, the team with the best record in baseball from 2003 to 2012. To recap, only 2 of the 10 won the World Series. When I did this for 2013 to 2022, we had 4 champions. One lost the World Series, two lost in the Championship Series, and five lost in the Division Series. So I guess that goes to show you, with half the teams not even winning a playoff series, maybe having the best record came with some kind of playoff curse. If you enjoyed this video, please drop a like. And if you're new here and want to see more content like this, please give me a sub. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.